Welcome back, mitochondriacs. It's Dr. Peebler for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. So as our playlist and as this series is titled, cancer is a mitochondrial metabolic disease. And we have talked about a variety of cellular pathways that are outside of and to some degree inside of the mitochondria when talking about cancer, metabolism, and biology. However, we have not yet in this series talked about what mitochondria are and why they're important and why they are the key to understanding most of human pathology, disease, and especially cancer. So I wanted to get started with this because it is fundamental for us all to understand that life is energy. And in particular, that energy that we're talking about when it comes to life originates in the mitochondria, in particular across the inner mitochondrial membrane. And as it says on the slide, the loss of electrical potential across mitochondria and cell membranes distinguishes alive from dead. And as you can see here, this is the end result of having no energy at all, death not being alive. And then there is maximum wellness, which is perfectly functioning mitochondria, abundant energy and a well-oiled machine. However, a lot of us, especially in this day and age, live somewhere here in the middle. And sadly, as the years go on, and as modern life starts to take over, it seems like the majority of the population is going down to the lower areas of this graph where we have diseases, irreversible degeneration, disability, and premature death. So energy is life. And again, I want to reiterate that that energy originates in this important organelle called the mitochondria. This is a schematic of a eukaryotic cell which is what we all are. And I'm going to highlight a couple of different areas that you may recognize. This central purple circle is the nucleus. This is where our DNA is located, our nuclear DNA. And this is where the majority of the genes that are expressed in physiology and life are transcribed to RNAs, which then get converted into proteins through a process called translation. However, in this discussion, we're gonna be talking about this red oblong organelle called the mitochondria. The mitochondria are important to look at from a anatomical perspective. As you can see here, we have an outer membrane by this brown area here, and we have the inner membrane by this kind of tan area here. In the middle of these, we have what they call the mitochondrial matrix. Between the two membranes, we have the inner membrane space. And as you can see, the inner membrane is folded repeatedly on itself. And this is even less dramatic to what a real mitochondria looks like. But these folds help give the mitochondria extra surface area to perform its important jobs of energy creation. And these folds are called cristae. This is the same thing, only instead of having the full name, it has acronyms, OMM, outer mitochondrial membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane, et cetera. So if I can have you and challenge you to read one medical paper or scientific paper, it would be this paper. This is a extremely well-written and comprehensive look at mitochondria. It's called Mitochondria. It's all about energy. And what it says is that mitochondria play a key role in both health and disease. That is true. The function is not limited to energy production, but serves multiple mechanisms varying from iron and calcium homeostasis to the production of hormones and neurotransmitters, such as melatonin. They enable and influence communication at all physical levels through interactions with other organelles, the nucleus, and the outside environment. The literature suggests crosstalk mechanisms between mitochondria and circadian clocks, the gut microbiome, and the immune system. They might even be a hub for supporting the integrity and integrating activity across all these domains. Hence, they may be the missing link in both health and disease. So I'm going to take a step back here, and I just want to address that most of us, when we're going through whatever level of training that we went through, we learn about the mitochondria in the context of energy production, the powerhouse of the cell, they call it. And although that is very cliche, it is also very true. The energy that is used and made in the cell is made by the mitochondria. Can't argue with that not going to dispel that. Now we can talk about whether or not ATP is the only energy source. Some would argue that it's not. Gilbert Ling, for example, Jack Cruz, for example, would argue that it is not the primary energy source. And we'll get to that later. Those are sacred cows within biology, biochemistry, molecular biology, 
science in general that are at this time being contradicted by physicists, by math, things that are hard to argue with. But I'll digress. What is coming to light is that mitochondria are much more than the powerhouse of the cell. They are they are fundamental in so many different ways. And I think the best way to look at that is by looking at this picture right here. So although this is still a very simplistic diagram, it's going to help us understand that there are many jobs that are done and taken care of by the mitochondria. So let's start off with what we all have, most of us have learned throughout the years, and that is energy production. So in this case, we have the TCA cycle, the tri carboxylic acid cycle or the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle that's located in the mitochondrial matrix. Okay. And then inside the inner mitochondrial membrane between the cristae is where oxfos or oxidative phosphorylation happens, which is where the majority of ATP are made through the electron transport chain. And then part of that is going to make ATP. And there's no question that ATP production is the, probably the main job for the electron transport chain, but it's also important for other substrate production, building blocks for other things, such as neurotransmitters, hormones, the backbone of RNA and DNA, nucleic acids, lipids, proteins. And then it's also going to be important for the creation of several signaling molecules. It used to be thought of that ROS or reactive oxygen species were all bad and that we needed to take large amounts of antioxidants in order to quelch this reactive oxygen species. But believe it or not, if you were to do that, and we'll talk about this as we get further along in the mitochondrial redox series, but if you were to do that, you would actually cause damage because those ROS in the proper ratios at the right times are actually used as cellular communicators to both inside the mitochondria and even into the nucleus to control gene expression. It's important for lactate homeostasis, glucose homeostasis, calcium homeostasis, iron homeostasis. It's important for traffic and transportation of biomolecules. It's important for communication with other parts of the cell and throughout the body. It's intimately involved with the nucleus and epigenetics and gene expression. It's important for cell fate regulation, such as apoptosis, programmed cell death. It's involved with the circadian rhythm, the gut microbiome, the central nervous system, and the autonomic nervous system, as well as metabolism and immunity. So as you can see, although what most of us learn in biology and biochemistry, OXFOS, TCA cycle, Krebs cycle are all true. They are all very important for our overall well-being and health. It has a lot of other jobs besides that. As a matter of fact, just as a teaser, it was not understood that mitochondria were responsible for making its own supply of melatonin. It used to be thought of that melatonin was only produced in the pineal gland and only released at night. And we've debunked that just pretty recently. So there's just a lot of things that a lot of us, even in advanced levels of training, did not learn about by this important organelle. And I want to teach you as many facets as I understand. And as more understanding comes out through scientists and medical literature, I want to try to bring that to you as well. So we have looked at this slide before, and this is basically a overview of human metabolism. Okay. During our cancer series so far, we talked a lot about glycolysis, which is where we take sugar or glucose and we convert it into a chemical called pyruvate. And as we talked about at length during the Cancers and Metabolic Disease series, we know that pyruvate in cancer is shuttled to lactate through a process called the Warburg metabolism or aerobic glycolysis. In normal physiology, that is not the case. You do not have a high levels of lactate. Pyruvate is supposed to be transported inside of our healthy mitochondria and then converted through an enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase, PDH, to an important chemical called acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA is going to have important jobs, but it is going to be the first step into the Krebs cycle from glucose. And when the Krebs cycle is doing what it's supposed to do, it's going to expel CO2, the gas that we exhale, and it's going to make a couple different things. It's going to make a product called NADH and FADH2. And these are important next step biomolecules that is going to then help us create ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. Again, there's a lot of other jobs that the mitochondria are doing, but this is the basics of human and really eukaryotic metabolism. Let's zoom in a little bit. So this is the Krebs cycle. This is also known as a citric acid cycle. This is also known as a TCA cycle. A lot of us in high school, college, and beyond level biology have seen this at least, are aware of it at least. This is a series of chemical reactions that starts with pyruvate, can gets converted to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA gets on a series of chemical reactions and through various enzymes gets converted to the FADH2 and the NADH that we need to run 
the electron transport chain. We do make some ATP during this process, very little. We do excel CO2, as I talked about before. This is a very busy slide, and it's exceedingly important to understand, probably not so much as a patient or as a healthcare consumer, although if you want to learn this, this is fantastic knowledge to have, but it's probably a little bit high level for the average consumer. This is really, really cool because what this slide essentially shows is it not only shows the enzyme, let's say pyruvate dehydrogenase, talked about this enzyme several times in the past. It gets inhibited during the Warburg metabolism by an enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase. And so we've talked about in particular, for example, B1, thymine, and a complete video about how it can help relieve pseudohypoxia. So if you're deficient in B1 or lipoic acid or magnesium or B2 or B3 or B5, that can inhibit the ability for pyruvate dehydrogenase to work effectively. Pyruvate cannot get converted to acetyl-CoA. Pyruvate builds up. Pyruvate can then cause pseudohypoxia through stimulation of hypoxia inducible factor 1-alpha. We're not going to get back into cancer biology at this time, but as you can see, every enzyme, aconitase, isocitrate dehydrogenase, these little green bubbles show what nutrients are important for that enzyme to function so that this chemical step can get converted to this chemical step. It shows the importance of why we have to eat. Although food is fuel, carbohydrates, proteins and fats all cycle in through the Krebs cycle to make ATP ultimately. However, the reason we need micronutrients is because of these reasons. They act as cofactors or as coenzymes for these enzymes so that they can function adequately. The other bubbles here are actually blockades or blockers or inhibitors of these enzymes. So for example, fluorine, mercury, arsenic, reactive oxygen species, hydrogen peroxide, nitric oxide, peroxynitrate. These can actually block this enzyme or in this case, aluminum or cisplatin, they can block this enzyme. And it helps us understand why and how some of these chemicals that we all think is bad, and they may be bad, why they're bad, because they're actually blocking our ability to convert food energy into usable cellular energy. This is a kind of a graphical representation of the electron transport chain, which we're going to be talking about at length, because the way that most of us learn about the electron transport chain is not the reality of how modern science has characterized it. Most of us have seen diagrams like this, maybe not like this, because this has the cofactors like CoQ10, fatty acids, carnitine, etc. But it, it has, you've, we've seen complex one, complex two, coenzyme Q10, cytochrome C, complex four, and the ATPase. And we've seen in general that NADH is then converted to NAD through this process, donates electrons, donates a proton. We, a lot of us have seen this during our biology and biochemistry training at various levels of education. And we also know that, you know, the ATPase converts ADP and this inorganic phosphate to ATP, which is energy currency of life. We may have not have seen where it has the cofactors and what's required for these enzymes to work, but we've seen this. And we've seen how separated these things are, like as if they're miles apart on this inner mitochondrial membrane. This is the inner mitochondrial membrane that we're looking at right here, okay? And the goal of this is to make ATP, which looks like this chemically. Most of us have seen pictures like this, where we have complex one, complex two, complex three, four, and the ATPase. And we're going to talk about these things in much greater detail, but this is a way to learn about these things. This is a way to learn that NAD, NADH couple happens here. This is where protons are pumped into the inner mitochondrial membrane space to create a proton gradient, which then is then used by the ATPase to create ATP through the gradient. And we see that these, these bubbles like structures are very separate. But again, that's not the reality. The reality is we form elaborate multi-unit mitochondrial respirosomes and super complexes. And those are important to maximize electron flow and to minimize reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species, which can damage energy production and damage cells when they happen in excess. Let's go over the basics of the electron transport chain. We're going to go much deeper as we get through this, probably much deeper than you ever realized that was even possible. But essentially this, when the Krebs cycle is done with proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, they are converted essentially into these reducing agents, NADH and FADH2. These cytochrome proteins, these mitochondrial intermembrane complexes are multi-subunit proteins, which means they have a, an aggregation of many proteins. These are huge complexes. And they are responsible for not only the collecting of electrons from these molecules, but also the pumping of protons or hydrogen ions into the inner mitochondrial membrane space. So just like when a dam takes a lake or a reservoir, and then we have water or hydrogen, in this case, on this side of the dam, this is like the hydroelectric 
turbine engine, literally, that spins and allows some of the potential energy that is built up on this side of the membrane to come down the gradient, spin this FO head, which then creates the ability for ADP, adenosine diphosphate, to be converted to adenosine triphosphate, the usable form of energy. So like it says here, inside the mitochondrial matrix, the electron transport chain and the ATP synthase nano machine are tightly coupled systems to provide energy for metabolism. This thing's unbelievable. This thing spins at 9,000 revolutions per minute. 9,000 revolutions per minute. You make more ATP in a day than you weigh. There is more electrical potential across this membrane than a bolt of lightning when you account for the scale. This is the magic and the absolute miracle of life right here. The reason why cyanide kills you is because one enzyme in this step is blocked. Complex four. You block complex four, electrons can't flow, you don't make ATP, you die. That's how critical this is. And essentially what modern disease is, is a gradual dysfunction and inability to transport electrons, make ATP, which then powers all of life. So I want to stress how critically important this is for both health and disease. And if you care about your health, or if you want to fix a disease, this is where you look. And we're going to figure out exactly how they break. And we're going to look at exactly how we can fix them in the coming series. And it may take some time. I want to, I want to sprinkle in some practical tips we can do. Because for example, that's exactly why I started doing the, the ketogenic diet and the GKI and the ketone and the thymine and the vitamin C videos, because we'd done so much theory. We talked about so many very esoteric things, things that frankly, unless you have a, a major disease, you may not care about unless you're just very health conscious, which if you are, then fantastic, because I would hate for you to have to have any of these terrible things. But I want to sprinkle in some practical tips that we can do throughout this series and break it up a little bit because it can get a little bit difficult to follow. And you may think, how is this going to help me? So just be aware that I'm going to probably have several more didactic, I guess I'd call them, or literature based or mechanistic based to the video series, but then sprinkle in some practical things that you can actually start to implement now. Because I, ultimately, I want you to not be sick. If you like these videos, if you are interested in mitochondria, if you have people who you know in your life that are sick or that need to get a kick in the pants and, and fix their mitochondria so they can get well or stay well, share these videos. And until next time.